Happy, happy Tuesday. I hope you guys had an awesome Memorial Day weekend. Hope you are relaxed, rejuvenated, ready to rock and roll with some landscape photography today. If you could do me a huge favor, in the comments, let me know where you're joining us from. Two minutes to go. We are ready to rock and roll. We are on a roller coaster ride heading into what is going to be a landscape class with our friends over at Nikon.
Hello, 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 and welcome to everybody. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. If you could just do me a favor, let me know if you can hear me okay. Uh, we had some, it sounded like when I was doing the warm up, it sounded like I was in a well. And even though my name is Timmy, I am not in a well. I am here to talk a little bit about some landscape photography with my friends for Nikon. So I want to see who is here so far. We have Tony joining us from Dallas, Texas. Spoiler alert, Tony actually works at Nikon and he's going to be behind the scenes answering some questions. It looks like we have Linda Blackwell from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Welcome, Linda. Uh, we have Les Greenberg, not too far from the store here. Hi, Les. Hope you had a good weekend. Hello, Karna, joining us from sunny Canton, Michigan. Yes, absolutely. Beautiful weather out there. Jim Summers, great weekend of getting back into the saddle of rodeo photography. Very nice. Was that the local one? Let me know in the comments if that was the one that's uh, not too far from my place in between you and I. Who else do we have here? Don Rogers checking in from Muncie, Indiana, Ball State University. Hello, hello. Looks like we have our friend uh, Jeff Penn also from Nikon joining us. Uh, he's behind the scenes answering some questions as well and said sound is sounding good. So I want to go over just a few little housekeeping items before we get started. So I'll go ahead and throw this up on the screen. Uh, we are still open at the store uh, from 10 to 7 Monday through Friday and then 10 to 5 on Saturday. So really the only change right now is we're not open on Sundays, uh, but very soon we will be opening that back up as well. And I wanted to also, if you have anything that you want in this live stream, please let us know if there's something that you want to see more of, less of, um, and a new host is not an option, guys. I'm here to stay. You can't get rid of me. Uh, but if you do want to have a different topic that you want to see, please let us know. And if you are coming in the store, I wanted to share with you just a few things of what to expect. Number one, our facility is disinfected multiple times a day. Uh, we're making sure that you know, you are staying safe and you have a comfortable shopping experience. And that's why even when you are here in the store and if you see me, I'll be having my mask on. You can see my official Pixel Connection mask. Um, I'll make sure that you guys are staying safe. Right now, nobody's in the store, so coast is clear. Uh, we do have hand sanitizer here. We have uh, signs up to keep six foot away. We're just trying to do our part to make sure everybody is nice and comfortable. Real quick before we get started, I wanted to also kind of put a note out there about the PPA. They have about a week left where they're opening up all of their content for free to photographers. So all you have to do is head over to ppa.com slash in it together and you'll be able to find even more content as far as learning how to do things with photo, video, business. Again, the PPA is a great organization, so I wanted to share that with you guys. So what are our goals for today? Number one is to pull you away from the fear, the uncertainty, and the doubt. There's a lot of FUD going on around there. I want to pull you guys back in, rope you in using the uh, rodeo context, uh, pull you guys back in and make sure that we are focused on our hobby that we have in common, and that is photography. Even if it is for an hour, my goal is to pull you away from that and have fun and talk about photography. I also want to get you motivated to try something new, something that's outside of your comfort zone. Again, this might be something that in the future could also turn into a profitable area. So take those landscape shots that you, you know, have sitting there and maybe start selling them to different different hotels, different online avenues, selling them to friends and family, maybe put a coffee table book together. Uh, maybe you've never even thought about landscape photography, and this could be a new niche for you. As always, if you have absolutely any questions, you can reach out to me, uh, social at thepixelconnection.com, and I'll be more than happy to help you. So what I'm going to do is just a little pull them out of the stream. It looks like we are ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Alex in here. How are we doing today, sir? Hi there. Doing pretty well. How are you today? I am living the dream. I'm digging your uh, your Nikon uh, little banner there. Love the Nikon sitting there on the counter. I'm digging, I'm digging your set, man. It looks super pro, super pro. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll start by getting your presentation up there. And while we're doing that, so tell us a little bit about you. So what do you do? Um, what brought you to landscape? Stuff like that. Sure. Uh, my name is Alex Bostowski. I work for Nikon as MPS, but basically I've been shooting Nikon cameras since I was 12, um, 12 or 13 roughly. Um, started in film, moved to digital pretty early, and I just tried to 
I don't know. I've always, I've always loved finding out what the tools in photography can do. Cause once you know what the tools can do, you have more options. So it's, it's important to have that creative mind and inspiration and everything. But if you're, if your camera isn't producing what's in your brain, that's what used to frustrate me the most. And so that's what I spent a lot of effort really learning is, is how to make the camera do what you want it to do. So it's uh, I've done everything from infrared to uh, UV to weddings, to landscape, to sports. I mean, just about any kind of photography that I can think of roughly I've done at least once. Um, but yeah, awesome. it's, uh, I like to be versatile. Um, so let me let me get the uh, presentation going. Perfect. Yeah. Let's see. And then, guys, if you have questions, we have so much knowledge here uh, in the chat and ready to serve you. So if you do have absolutely any questions, whether that be product related, whether that be settings related, uh, whatever it is, please put it in the comments. That's what we are here for to answer those questions that you might have. So we'll go ahead and pull the presentation up. Mm -hmm. All right, is it uh, coming up? Or is it still me on camera there? You are good to go, my friend. Excellent, perfect. First time using the platform, so I just wanted to be sure. So again, thank you so much for an excellent intro. Thank you all so much for joining us. I really hope you enjoy the class. Um, as I was saying before, my name's Alex Pistowski. I'm joined by my, uh, my colleagues, Tony and Jeff, and we're happy to help however we can. So you might be wondering basically how to do some landscape photography. And for those of you that still have schedules to meet, things to do and places to be, basically here's the quick version. So step one, go outside. Step two, take a picture. And in these modern times, of course, try to social distance as best you can. So for those of you that uh, just needed that much to get out there, go for it, have fun. But for the rest of you that are actually in here for a real class, the rest of the class, buckle up because we've got a lot of good things to talk about today. So landscape photography is a really broad ranging topic, of course, and so it's going to be a little bit all over the place, but, but I'm going to try to make sure that I have things in here that can help you no matter what level of experience you have and whatever your just experience in landscape photography has been so far. So to start with, how on earth do you do this sort of thing when travel is relatively restricted? I mean, you might think of when you think of landscape photography, you might think of places like Paris or, you know, beautiful national parks. Um, you know, rainforest kind of situations. This one's one of my favorites from a vacation years ago out to Estes Park. But the reality is that you don't have to wait to find amazing locales like this. If you're in a great place like this with perfect lighting, it's, it's hard to miss. You know what I mean? You can just about do anything and get a great shot of it. But I find realistically, landscape photography for me has meant close to home because a lot of what I've had to learn early on was before I had a car. So I had to learn a lot of this stuff on a bike or walking around. And that means a lot of stuff that I had if I was in Virginia, I might be somewhere in Virginia. I might not have a particular place I want to go, but it's important to keep your camera on you everywhere, whether you're just going to your own backyard, around the corner somewhere, down the street, you get the basic point. In fact, in the backyard example here, this was just the most purple uh, rhododendron bloom I think I've ever seen. And so it's a little thing, not certainly a, a word winning photograph, but it's something I wanted to document, something I wanted to capture and be able to show. And that's so much of the point is I want to make sure that no matter what you want to do, you're able to do it relatively easily without really any pain or fear or anything. So to start with, if you're the type of person that lives on the green auto mode, that's OK. Green auto mode still produces the same kind of image quality any other mode will. So when you push the button, basically speaking, the overall quality of the image isn't going to be terribly different from if you changed a lot of things. But the reality is that auto doesn't necessarily know what you're photographing. And because of that, it's got a lot of good general settings for general photography. But since you're here to learn, it's worth it to get a little more specific. Now, if you're used to auto and you don't want to move too much from there, scene modes like landscape would make a lot of sense to try. Landscape scene mode is basically auto, but since you're telling the camera what you're doing, in this case landscape, it can set itself up in a way that makes more sense. It would set itself up in a way that I might set itself uh, more manually, basically if I were controlling it. So basically scene modes are auto variants that are very good shortcuts to more manual settings. You don't have to know all of the things about the camera yet to really optimize it for what you're shooting. That's what the scene modes are for. But for those of you looking for a little bit more than that, aperture priority is generally where I'll be shooting most landscapes. And the reason is the most important thing for me to control most of the time is going to be my depth of field. And that's how much stuff is in focus, and that's controlled with the aperture. So the A mode that you can see on the dial here is aperture priority. You have direct control over the aperture, and then the camera can manage the shutter speed and may or may not manage ISO, depending on how you have it set. 
So there's a lot of settings and you may be thinking, perfect, this is the part I've been waiting for, nothing but menu. Um, but I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this and I don't think you need to copy all of these down. I'm just gonna call out a couple of recommendations here. So one is ISO. The lower the number ISO, the better it is. Um, but the best quality is truly the lowest numbered ISO. You may have noticed your camera also has an option like low one, something like that. That's in a uh, stop lower in ISO overall, but it's not the lowest numbered. Um, so basically if your camera offers 100 as the lowest number, go to that. 64 on cameras like a D850 or Z7 will produce your best image quality. Um, but once you go down to low one, you're still getting good image quality, but you're maybe losing a little bit of dynamic range, particularly in the highlights. As far as um, things like white balance, I like usually daylight white balance, but if you want to add a little warmth to your scene, make the whole thing look a little more inviting, cloudy is an easy way to do that. Uh, cloudy adds a little bit of orange, giving the whole thing a little bit more of an inviting, warmer tone. Um, one of the other things I would really recommend if you have the option is using a virtual horizon. Many of our cameras, even our SLRs, have this option in the viewfinder, and almost all of our cameras have the option on the LCD screen. If it's a mirrorless camera, it definitely has this. Uh, basically what this is, is just what you think it is. It's a virtual horizon so that you can keep the camera level, so you're not aimed up or down or rolled in either way. Um, basically, you can fix this sort of thing later on in software, but if you do that, you wind up with cropping your image. So if there was something important on the edge of it, you may not have it any longer. And it messes with your composition, so that's never fun. The other thing, though, is that whether you're aimed up or down actually has a pretty decent effect on distortion for many of the things in your shot, which I'll cover in a little bit. Um, so it's smart to try to be level if you can be, but as long as it works well for your composition. The other things I would recommend, generally, matrix metering is going to do a great job in most situations. Most of the time, that's what I'll be using. And for VR, which is vibration reduction, I'd leave that on in almost all conditions. The only ones I would turn it off in are when it's on a tripod and everything is truly stable. So you're shooting with a cable release, there's no wind, every bit of vibration's out. Or if you're doing very long exposures, or if you're doing composites, things like focus stacks and HDRs, I find I like a little more with VR turned off if they're on a tripod. Now, how to actually shoot. So this is not just obviously a buttons and menus class, I promise. Um, what I want you to think about isn't just how your camera does things. I want you to also think about how you do things, how you see, how you think. So one of the things to consider is how high, or basically your angle. I know it's gonna sound super straightforward, the, whether you look up or down or straight ahead, and it is. It's not any much more complicated than that, but here's why I'm talking about it. Take a look at the trees on the far left photo. Not the best compositionally, necessarily, but the trees are absolutely vertical. They're completely nice and straight up and down. Now, moving to the middle frame and then to the frame on the right, they actually lean in progressively more. This is an effect called keystoning, and it's something that happens uh, you know, anytime you look up or down. So if your camera's anything but dead level, you'll have keystoning. Now, this is most often talked about in architectural photography, because you don't want a building looking like it's leaning over or in some kind of unusual distortion. But I like to think of this as also a relevant thing for when you're photographing trees or other natural landforms that have straight lines, because otherwise they may wind up bending. Um, it's not so much that they curve, but they'll lean in a way that can look somewhat unnatural, especially once you get used to it. So don't forget your angle will actually determine a bit of distortion in certain things. But then there's, of course, your height. I like to think that most of the best photos I've taken probably didn't come from eye level. And that's just because eye level is normal. You're used to it. It's what you literally see all the time. So when it it comes to making an interesting photograph, that's generally one that, in my opinion, makes your viewer look at it for longer. They look around in it, they, they might think about it, but my main purpose is engagement. I want somebody to be able to look at a photo for a while and not get bored of it. And so for that, different heights usually help. Shooting something at an unusually high or low angle is unusual. And so generally the novelty of that alone can help a bit. But the reason I prefer low angles overall for landscape photography, shots like this, is that they anchor the foreground. And it was one of the early tricks that I learned in landscape photography that I really appreciated was that by anchoring the foreground, by putting things or a whole bunch of stuff like this in the foreground, you give your viewer kind of a way to walk into it, sort of a way to, to engage with it differently. Um, I really find that this helps. And I'll talk about that probably too much throughout this presentation. But don't forget, if you're hiking in the forest and, and you start to lose the forest to the trees, pick a tree, look up, you know, look up, look straight down, uh, look around you in ways you didn't look before. That's generally where I find the more interesting perspectives are going to come from. For example, here's a great situation in which I spent a lot of effort and completely failed. I spent 26 hours driving, 
13 hours, then a three hour hike, then 13 more hours to get this shot. And this is not the shot I was there to get. But what this is, is basically, um, here's what happened. This was back in, I think, August of last year or so. I think so. I might already be a year off by now. But either way, it was when a recent solar eclipse happened, viewable from a large part of the East Coast. And I drove 13 hours south for that, then hiked about two or three hours in very high heat um, to get to the top of a mountain ridge that I hoped would let me see the totality shadow on the ground across an otherwise relatively flat part of the landscape. I wish I could say that that's what I got, but I didn't. After getting there and hiking and getting exhausted, I spent a lot of time looking at this, basically staring at the ground. Because as I'm hiking with a good heavy camera bag and tripod and things for a time lapse, and I had two or three cameras with me, I just never made it. So what you're seeing though is kind of interesting. What you're seeing is basically that solar eclipse that I missed, but reflected on the ground. What's happening is that the leaves are acting as little pinhole lenses. And so what you're seeing, that arc there, is actually the moon covering the sun. So what's amazing about this is certainly not my favorite shot, but my point still stands that even though I didn't get what I went out there to get, what I thought I was going to be able to find that day, I still got something. And I still got something interesting enough that it taught me a good lesson about how to shoot. And obviously that if I'd been an hour earlier, I would have gotten a much better shot. So always good to be prepared. Um, other things though, if you've ever wound up in a situation where you've gotten a wonderful photo and then you've had to spend all night working on like editing out your camera bag because it's also in your wonderful photo but you didn't mean for it to be, this is a bit of advice that might really help save you some time. Once you find what you really like about your photograph, you know, composition, lighting, everything, then find what you don't like about it. Deliberately take, if you have the time, that extra second or two to look around and look for stuff you wish wasn't there. That might be a soda bottle sitting there, or in this case, it's these branches in the upper and right parts of the frame. It's not that they do a lot of damage or be possible to remove later on in editing, but that's all going to take a lot more effort than just stepping a couple of steps forward and getting them out of the frame while not changing anything in a negative way too, too much. Now, obviously, make sure your composition and things still work for what you want, but basic point is, if there's something you can eliminate in your shot, do it. It's much easier to do it by hand in most conditions than it is to do it later on. And so much of this is that I like doing the editing that I want to do, but I despise doing the editing that I have to do. So if I have to take something out of there because I forgot it, it will annoy me the entire time. So that's why that stands particularly salient in my mind. But like I was saying about the foreground, foreground gets you into the photograph. It gives a good way to, to kind of walk into it. And don't forget, there are things like the rule of thirds that can help you keep your horizon lines basically something off center. If you just put a horizon line through the center, that's okay. And in some cases, like with great mirrored landscapes, like a salt flat after the rains, it can actually work. But for the most part, I find try to prioritize one or the other. Try to prioritize your foreground by put, making it around two thirds or so of the bottom of the frame, or your sky by making it around two thirds of the, or so of the top. Not at all a you have to do it kind of rule, but not a bad guideline if you're used to your shots being centered and, and not being as engaging. And also, again, don't forget to really get low. I find getting physically low to the ground instead of just looking down really makes a difference. It, it has so many different objects looming large in your foreground, and that can really help. Um, if you've already gotten shots of the fall landscapes out there where you've gotten, you know, lovely orange and red trees surrounding a, a waterfall and stuff like that, that's beautiful stuff to get. But after you get it a few hundred times, it's important to look around and try to expand what you can find. So this type of shot, not necessarily my favorite, but I like the color contrast a lot in it. And it's just a different type of fall shot than I've had before. So, for example, here's one that I got in my yard a few weeks ago. Um, I've got uh, some flowers that were in bloom. I'm over in New Jersey, and so we have quite a lot of stuff coming into bloom currently. And this is, for those of you unfamiliar, just a simple patch of periwinkle. Nothing terribly special, just a nice kind of ground cover. Um, but the thing is that this sort of shot with a lot of highlights and shadows wasn't really doing it for me. I like contrast, but I, but I don't like it the way it is in this. So what I did is I got lower. By getting lower, all of a sudden now I've got backlighting happening. I can see the way the flowers glow a little bit. I can see more, more about how they're made up, you know, the veins and the leaves and things like that. By getting lower still, adding some flare, I honestly kind of like the look of it. I generally like um, being deliberate with flare. You can use it, but you don't have to. So for example, cutting it part way off like this can change the way that flare looks. Same thing with shooting at a higher F number. You can make flare star quite a bit. Um, but of course, my favorite shot of that day was getting even slightly lower still. The whole time I'm just sinking down lower and lower into the periwinkle patch. And I end up with a shot like this. 
What I like about it is to go from basically here, standing height, looking down, to here really did not take much effort. And even though in this shot, there's a trailer and a chain link fence behind this patch of periwinkle, you don't see them because I'm so low that I'm looking up and the background's nice and blurry because I'm focused on something close. So I know you don't probably think of this as a necessarily landscape, but when you don't have a full vista of a landscape that you can truly utilize, you know, if you don't just have that kind of scene you stumble onto that's perfect already, well consider that you can find elements in those scenes that can already be extremely nice. And as long as you can compose the parts of your shot you don't like out of your shot, you can still make some really nice work happen, even in a parking lot or down the street or wherever you are. Now, if you are shooting low like that and you do want everything in focus, there are a few ways to do it. Um, if you notice though, going from F4, the shot, the shot here, basically to F22, it puts more things out of blur in a way, it makes them less blurry. But I never really think of it as making them sharp because look at your background here. It's not sharp, it's still blurry. It's less blurry than it was, but it definitely is not sharp. And so that's the thing, aperture doesn't really control sharpness in my opinion. It, it does uh, control through diffraction how much is sharp, but ultimately it's really controlling how much is blurry around your focus point. Your focus point is the only part of your photograph that's ever truly completely sharp. If you shoot wider angle and closer to infinity and you have a high F number, you can get enough of it in focus that it will all look sharp enough that you probably don't mind. But there is a technique out there that can actually make everything completely sharp from back to front. And that's called focus shift shooting. Focus shift shooting is something offered in some of our cameras. The D850, 780, Z6, and Z7 are the ones I can think of that have this menu option. Now, if you don't have one of those, that's okay. You can still do this sort of technique manually. What this is, is you're starting at the nearest part of the subject that you want in focus, take a picture, then move the focus out towards infinity, take another picture, and repeat until you have slices of everything in focus. Now, the camera can do this way faster and way more accurately. So if this is a technique you want to use a lot, it's worth it to have the technology that can get you there quickly. So here's what this looks like if you do have one of those cameras. Uh, basically, as long as you have an autofocus lens on the camera and you have a card in there and your date and time is set, I don't know why, but that part is relevant to this, um, you'll have this option, uh, as long as it's an AFS or AFP lens. Anyway, so number of shots is pretty straightforward. It's just how many it will take at, through the series. But if it hits infinity before the end of that series, it'll stop that sequence of shots. The idea there is if you hit infinity in only 50 frames, there's no reason for the camera to then shoot another 100 frames of infinity. It won't gain you anything. Focused up with is how big a jump it makes every time. So that's uh, basically how many photos you're gonna, it, it's basically how big a step. So the thing is that it's a one to 10 scale and it's not corresponding to any known measurement that I can find. It's just relative. So if you're doing one to one macro or anything very close up, I really like one or two. Generally for landscape, three or four is okay. And if you're shooting wide angle, high aperture, and you need to work very quickly, then going higher than that's fine too. My goal is overlap. I wanna have a lot of overlap per shot, so I have the sharpest end result. So the lower your, in, uh, your uh, focus step width number is, the more frames you're gonna to need to cover the same distance. So, but the more frames you have, the sharper the end result. Um, interval till next shot is very relevant if you're shooting flash or raw files. Basically, it slows the camera down by the interval you set to make sure that the flash can fully recycle or the raw files can fully be written to the memory card. If you go too fast and miss even a single frame in this, basically the entire sequence is ruined. You won't be able to go back and redo it. Folk, uh, peaking, um, oh, first frame exposure lock is great if you're not shooting manual, but for this, and primarily this, I would say manual is a really good option. Any type of composite like this, I like to, uh, where the exposure is intended to stay the same at, at the end result, I like to have each shot being the same exposure. That way they don't change. Also for this sort of thing, turn off VR, so there's no change in composition too. Um, peaking stacked image is only available on a Z-series camera and lens, and that will give you a preview after you shoot of what the end result can look like. Silent photography is great, but it doesn't work with flash. And it's, if you're shooting high shutter speeds in artificial lighting, silent photography can produce some aberrations. So generally I would shoot silent if I'm outside without flash, but I would turn it off if I'm inside or if I'm using flash. Basically all of this stuff are settings that make this process much more accurate, much faster than I've ever done it by hand. It would normally take me about 50, uh, to take 50 accurate shots would take me about an hour. Camera does it at about five frames per second though, so it's getting that same amount of work done in about 10 seconds.
But here's what I like about this and what you wind up with as, as your end result. Basically, first shot in, as you can see, not very much in focus. 40 shots later, still not very much. Going 75, 85, 90. I have to make it to 90 shots in before I have the background in focus. Now, going farther than this wouldn't be terribly useful since you can't see the rest of infinity past that tree line. But basically, by combining all of those shots in the sequence, you'd have in camera, if you have a Z-series camera lens, a preview like this. Um, anything that's in high contrast like that's in focus. But the leaves that are in the lower left part are slightly out of focus, which is why they're so much darker and less contrasty. But none of the cameras composite in camera, meaning that no matter what, you still have to take all of these files in your folder, put them into third-party software on your computer, and then stitch them together into a composite. But that composite can be amazing. You can go from a shot like this at f22, where diffraction's making things less sharp and you really don't have everything in focus anyway, to a shot like this. Um, I would generally be shooting f11 or f13 for these sort of composites. And this is an instance in which I would say everything is actually sharp. From the leaves that you can see in the foreground all the way to that tree line, it is actually sharp. And that's just one of the rare times you can really do that. So again, it's a, it's a neat technique, works great for landscape, great for macro, terrible for moving subjects. So just make sure whatever you're photographing isn't moving if you intend to employ this trick. But like I said, for macro, even if it's a, only a half inch deep subject, this might be really helpful. So how about equipment? I know there's a lot to think about when it comes to packing a bag and a lot of the full frame cameras in our line, I'd say get the most intrigue and press. That's because full frame cameras typically have an advantage in low light, so better low light sensitivity, or an advantage in resolution, or in some cases they can have an advantage in both. But for landscape photography, especially if you travel a lot or if you plan to hike a lot with your equipment, full frame cameras have the major disadvantage of being larger, heavier, and ultimately more expensive. So it's also worth considering the DX format of cameras, which have smaller sensors, but still plenty larger than point and shoots and cell phones by, by a lot. Um, but they have smaller lighter lenses too, and they're often less expensive. Now, because they're less expensive, many people don't take them as seriously. But I'd say I've put more frames through a Z50 since I've gotten it than any other camera that we've had in the last few years. And I love very high resolution full frame cameras like a Z7 or D850. But the Z50 is on me all the time. It's on me when I go out to dinner, the rare times that I do. It's on me, you know, for takeout and things. It's on me when I walk the dog. It's on me when I visit my parents. It's on me pretty much all the time. And it's because it's very light, small, made of metal, and it's just a great little camera. So that's the thing is the, the bigger, heavier gear is awesome. And I have hiked at high altitudes in Colorado before with the D850 and a 19 tilt shift and a tripod just to make a particular shot happen. But that said, I'm getting more work done with the Z50 because it's always with me. So make sure that whatever you choose, that you carry it all the time. This stuff happens around your around your world. So make sure your camera's on you always. And if it's not because it's too heavy, then it may not be the right camera to consider for you. Now, hey, Alex, I we did have a question that came in. So do you want to wait till the end or do you want to have them as they come in? Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll have about this? I'll take this question, and then after that, um, let's hold the questions till the end if we can. Okay. Well, this one was about anchoring, so if you want to circle back to it, you want we could circle back to it at the end. Let's do that then, yeah, because I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about composition as we go. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to address that at the end. Perfect. So this lovely shot you're seeing here, the front multi-coated face of all of our lenses, is one of the best reasons to consider any Nikon camera is the, is the glass. But of course, whatever you're shooting, truly any brand, any anything out there, make sure it's working for you. Make sure it does what you want it to do. Um, so yeah, by the way, and when it comes to the Nikon lenses, the best quality for the F-mount generally are gonna be the gold ring lenses. They're usually weather sealed, best optics. The Z-mount, anything in the S series is also that. Nano crystal coated, uh, weather sealed, best optics we have. Um, so let's talk lenses a little bit. Wide angle lenses absolutely are the lenses that most people think of, I find, when it comes to photography and landscape photography, because they do what you generally want. They get everything in. So wide angle lenses are, in a very straightforward way, wide angle of view. That's all that means, is that they see a really wide angle. Um, many of our widest angle lenses see past 90 degrees. So if you're inside a room, standing in one corner, you can photograph the other three corners of that room. That's how wide some of these get. And they even go wider than that sometimes. But the reason why people like this kind of lens, uh, with very low focal length numbers for wide angle, is because it gets everything in. 
But at the same time, it's important to consider that what you get in may or may not help your composition. So I like to think of photography in the inverse from how I think of painting and drawing. And I'm terrible at painting and drawing. Um, but basically, I've heard from many smarter people than myself that painting and drawing is a process of starting with a blank canvas and building it up, which makes sense. You're building up every bit of detail that you want your viewer to see deliberately. Photography, though, I think can be just as deliberate if viewed at the opposite perspective. That what photography is really good at is starting with everything you can see and narrowing it down to what you want your viewer to see to make that same kind of statement. So generally speaking, landscape, I love wide angle lenses. You can use them to get low, it can anchor the foreground, you can introduce perspective distortion that makes a nearby thing much bigger than a distant thing, which might look really good, like make one flower gigantic in a field of flowers, for example. Um, the most extreme lenses we have in that range for DX, for example, would be things like a 10 to 20 or 10 to 24. They can let you get past 100 degrees wide angle. But I also like to think about, given that narrowing of perspectives, telephoto lenses for landscape. It's really not a bad idea to think about lenses at each end of the range here. Because if you ever want to make the sun or moon look as big as this, you need a long focal length lens to do it. Wide angle will never do it for you. So a lens like the 2 to 5, the 500 millimeters in this case, um, is really the least expensive way that I've seen in our line to get that kind of focal length. But what I like about it is it's still extremely sharp, as you can see, in directly into the sun. It has no problem with contrast or flare. And it really is just a great, pretty big lens, but a great lens to use. So it's not uncommon that I'll skip some of the mid-range, sometimes using just primes for that. And I'll have a zoom wide and zoom telephoto. But then there are also specialty lenses, which if you already have a zoom, you know, if you already have a telephoto and a wide angle options, you might go, well, what else is there? There's a lot of cool stuff out there. Specialty lenses would include things like fisheye lenses, like this 8 to 15 zoom fisheye, and also perspective control lenses and things like that that we'll talk about more in a bit. But don't forget this too. When you're shooting outside or inside, macro really becomes relevant sometimes. As in, if you're just out there on a, on a kind of misty, meh kind of day, you get up close to the water droplets, you know, really make some different kinds of compositions happen. Uh, spring days, like what we're looking at now, although I swear it went from winter directly into summer where I am, um, basically, you've got a lot of flowers opening, a lot of insects coming out. And so for that sort of thing, getting close, honestly, is still a major part of the way I think of landscape photography. You can get close with a lot of our lenses, um, whereas, you know, you can make a tiny thing look pretty big. But a macro lens in our line lets you get dramatically closer. Macro really is much, much closer still. Um, and we have a bunch of those. A macro lens is what gets you from one to one magnification at to infinity in the same lens. So if you do a lot of this sort of stuff, it's handy to have. But basically, we have a wide range of options that do pretty much any budget or type of camera. So let's talk about full frame wide angle for a brief moment here. There's a lot of great options in the Z line. And if you have a Z series camera, use the Z mount lenses if you can. An F mount lens on a Z body is going to perform just as well as it ever did on the F body. But the difference will be that the Z mount is so much larger and closer to the sensor that the lenses designed for it can be designed differently. And so from that, they wind up being a bit sharper, better on distortion, better in a few different directions for optical quality. So if you have a Z body, the Z lenses will give you your best performance. But there's another reason to think about it too. If you are looking for a really wide angle full frame lens, 14 to 24 for the F mount is the widest option we have. The 14 to 30 on the Z mount is the widest we have for that. Now, of the two of them, I shoot the 14 to 30 a whole lot more. It at least travels with me much more often in my bag because it weighs so much less. The 14 24 is a great lens. It's 2.8. It's really a lovely optic all around, but you can't really filter it with normal commercially available filters. You have to go for a much larger one. And it's a much bigger and heavier lens. This uh, 14 to 30 is much more, much smaller, lighter, and more practical. And I don't mind the fact at all that it's an F4 because most of my landscape shooting isn't happening wide open. It's happening at the mid-range apertures like F8 or F11. So for me, carrying around an F4 lens is no real penalty. It just means my bag is lighter and generally I've spent less on my equipment. If you're out shooting 24 to 70 type ranges, the Z-mount has both a 2.8 version of that and it has an F4 version of that. Now, if you're wondering how the, the quality on the F4 in general, it's, not, it's still really, really good. The 24-70 F4 for the Z-mount was actually sharper than the equivalent 2.8s in the F-mount, but the new 2.8 for that is even sharper still. What I'm getting at is that you don't have to go for the 2.8s or 1.4s or the craziest stuff to get the best image quality. In fact, since you're probably shooting at F8 or so anyway, or at least you may be, it's worth considering what you really need out of your lens. 
if you need that 2.8 for nighttime landscape shooting, or maybe you do weddings for portraits on the side, then great, that's that's a great use for that. But if your only goal is to be hiking around and lighter gear would help you with that, consider an F4 or variable aperture lens. They're gonna be quite a lot lighter. Now, if you're shooting uh, the F-mount, which we have a lot of great options for, of course, uh, these are some of the wide angle options that we offer in the zooms. Now, 14, 24, and 24 to 70 are the two most expensive things on this list. And they're the two that a lot of people aspire to work up to in certain ways, especially if you're doing weddings and stuff like that. They're really great event photography lenses. But that's because the priority there is on high speed focus, high speed, uh, you know, like low light gathering ability for your focus system, and also the ability to throw background out of focus sometimes. Whereas for landscape, I generally more thinking along the lines of the 16 to 35 the, and the 24 to 120. Although if I need to go even lighter, the 1835 and 2485 are even lighter still. But the two that I've highlighted here provide a really good mix of weather sealing, versatility, and optical quality. So a shot like this done with the 16 to 35, I think just ethically should be done basically in black and white. You can shoot color if you want, but I really like the way a lot of landscapes look in black and white. Now, the other thing here though, is that if you're shooting monochrome in our cameras, you have an option in that monochrome setting. If you go into the shooting menu, set picture control, monochrome, and then filter effects. Um, basically, if you keep going to the right, you're going to get to monochrome. So you have an option for filter effects. One of those, you know, yellow, orange, red, and green. If uh, you select red, you can take a blue sky and turn it almost black the way you see it here. That's without any other physical filter on your camera. So if you want to have really high contrast landscape shots where you have a blue sky or a blue sky with clouds in it, um, shooting with the red filter in black and white can give you that balance of, of contrast in a really nice way. But here's what it took to get this shot is basically the lens and camera out there getting snowed on for a while. And it's important that, of course, if you are going to do this sort of stuff, that you get gear that handles it. Now, weather sealed gear is going to be heavier and more expensive. So this is that balance. That if a plastic bag type rain sleeve would protect your equipment, maybe that's the way to go. You need to stay absolutely as light as possible. But by shooting a good F4 like this, by shooting you know a good sealed body, basically they can handle this sort of weather. And what I like about this lens over a 14-24 in a very practical sense is that beyond the fact you can filter the 1635, it doesn't have a protruding front element. Now the 1424's lens hood protects it on a flat surface from, from damage, but ultimately if you're aimed straight ahead and especially if you're aimed up at all, snowflakes just seem to gravitate right to that front element, same with raindrops. So if you want to keep that shot clear for longer, for a time lapse or bad weather, 1635 means you're not cleaning your lens all the time. The other reason I really, really like it is the VR. I really like stabilization. And that's so that in this case, I was able to hand shoot it down to a fifth of a second. Now, just as a, an experiment, I tested it down to a half a second. And that was at one second, I couldn't really do it. But at half a second, I would say I got a probably an 80% success rate of sharp shots. And I mean, you can zoom all the way in on them, kind of sharp. So. I should have had a tripod without a doubt. And it's totally my fault that I didn't. Because I didn't have one, I had to get clever. And in this case, having good VR on a lens really was what saved me. Um, if you're ever in this situation though, where you want to get a good shot of water flowing, but, you, but it's too bright, you can't use a long exposures, you can use a polarizer, a neutral density filter, which we'll talk about later to help lengthen your shutter speeds. But you can also shoot multiple exposure modes in camera. When it combines them, you'll actually get an effect that looks a lot like this. So that way you can shoot regular shutter speeds and still make it look like you did a single long exposure. If you are doing a single long exposure, it's one of the rare times I would tell you to turn off the VR. Um, that when you're doing the focus shift composites. Long exposures, like eight seconds or, or more, let's say, basically at that point the VR has very little to do. And so if it has very little to do, there's no reason to have it on and able to move within your lens. So for those sort of situations, it's good to have it turned off. Um, also shots like this where you might be doing either a several hour exposure or a composite of multiple several minute exposures. So in this case, 34, 15 minute exposures were combined to get this shot. By the way, just an interesting note is that if you've ever done star trails and you can do them via either a single long exposure or a series of shorter exposures combined like this one here, notice the color in your stars. If you're just getting blank white, you're actually overexposing your stars. Drop your exposure a little bit until they start to produce color like this. And then you'll actually have a, a more accurate star field. And I, I think it looks better too. The 24 to 120 is one of the most versatile lenses that I've used. And it's, I know we have a 28 to 3, which has more focal length. And I know we have a 24 to 70, which focuses faster and is a 2.8. 
but this is such a nice balance that I'd say this one gets more use for me than either of the other two. It's also incredibly sharp. It's um, there have been really good lively debates between people I know and work with between this lens and a 24 to 72 8 the VR version especially since that's even a little sharper than the previous. And that's the thing is that this lens is so good and sharp that it's really up there with our best glass. But because it would come with a D750 or D780, people think of it as a kit lens, so they sometimes overlook it. This lens I'd say is one of the best overall versatile zooms we make for sharpness, distortion, and just general shooting. What I like about it is that whether you're going wide angle or in the middle or full telephoto on it, you can get everything in one lens. I mean, to go from basically this shot here to this shot here in the same lens is just really nice. Like, it's it's a nice ability to, to change perspective quickly. And also, this focus relatively close, but of course, not as close as the macro. Now, there are other lenses, though. The ones that we've talked about so far were zoom. There are also prime lenses. For those of you that don't know, prime lenses are just lenses that don't zoom, meaning that they have one focal length. So you just have one ring on there, a focus ring. And uh, if you want anything looking closer or farther back, you have to physically move closer or farther from it to make that happen. But what's nice about primes is that they let in a lot more light typically than our zooms do. So the fastest zooms we make are 2.8s. The fastest prime we make is a 0.95. For the F-mount, the fastest we make is a 1.2 manual focus or the 1.4 for autofocus. Now, what I like about the primes is that they're generally lighter and smaller. They're, they're much better at gathering light than the other ones are. And in some cases, they might wind up quite a bit sharper or with less distortion or fall off than the zooms do. Zooms, though, provide a lot of versatility and can replace a whole range of prime lenses separately put in your bag. So you might replace four or five primes with one zoom. So this is where it's up to you. One of my favorite combos is the 24 to 120 zoom and the 20 millimeter 1.8. 20 millimeter is one of the best lenses I've ever shot for certain types of landscape photography. And the PC lens down there at the bottom, which we've noticed is not nearly as good in low light and yet is much more expensive, that's also an interesting lens I'll cover in a little bit. But the 20 for nighttime photography is wonderful. Wider angle than our zooms go, for the most part, except for a wider angle zoom. Um, but what I like about it is wide open. It is still nice and sharp. It has excellent light fall-off characteristics, and it's just a great lens for gathering a lot of low light and not weighing very much itself. Um, essentially, that 1.8 aperture really can help here. If you think about uh, trying to get a good Milky Way shot like this, you need to limit your exposure time to 20 seconds or less, ideally less, especially if you zoom in at all. Once you zoom in a bit, lower and lower exposure times are needed so that you don't see the movement of the Earth which is reflected in the movement of the stars. I mean, the stars aren't really moving in this case, but you get the idea. Now, the thing is that to get that, you have to shoot a very high ISO and or a very low F number to let in a lot of light and make the camera very sensitive to that light. And so if you have a zoom lens that's a 3.5 to 5.6, let's say, or an F4 or a 2.8, you may have to be at 20,000 ISO or more to get that sort of shot. So by then, it might be very grainy, which may not look that good to you. Um, a low F number lens like this, like these little primes, means that you can have a much lower ISO, so better image quality overall, and still make the shot look just as bright. But for stuff like this, it's really not a bad idea at all. It really can help improve your image quality. Now, when it comes to distortion control, though, that's where the PC lenses get very interesting. PC stands for perspective control. And if you recall, at the very beginning of this, with the trees and the three different frames, where you're aimed straight ahead and angled up and angled up more. What I was talking about there, perspective distortion, or sorry, I'm not perspective, uh, keystone distortion, is basically what perspective control lenses are very good at mitigating. So a PC lens like this can mean that instead of angling up to get this perspective on the buildings, which would have them look the way they do, you keep the camera level and you angle the lens. You actually slide the lens up or down to get basically the same perspective, but a corrected image like this. Now what's happening is that because the sensor is parallel to the building, it's no longer keystoning on them. They're no longer projecting in a way that causes them to do this or that. So that removes that type of distortion pretty effectively. But of course, if you want that perspective, the ability to look up or down, that's what the PC lens is designed for. The other thing that they're really good at is that they're able to control focus um, in a way that's different than the way aperture does it. So aperture is just expanding how much blur you have outside of your focus point, your depth of field. What PC lenses do, and in our case, tilt shift lenses, is that they also let you kind of bend the focus. Um, so it's no longer parallel to your sensor. So it might line up more efficiently with your subject. Um, this is a really neat thing that I know most of you probably will never engage with. But if you've already got lenses you like, but you want to kind of know, like, 
you know, what, what was different between my camera and the camera that Ansel Adams used? There's a lot of differences, much more than I have time to cover here. One of them is the control that, that older large format photographers had on their lenses is a lot more expensive than the control we have on ours. But PC lenses give you some of those features for 35 millimeter cameras. So you go from this to that without cropping your shot, without ever touching software, and without having to really do very much work. Um, same kind of thing here. You might just be thinking about this for buildings, but in this case, we have standing rock, which is basically in the shot leaning rock. But by leveling out the camera, using the virtual horizon and shifting the lens, you can get to the same perspective again, but now everything is not distorted the same way that it was. Now the distortion has basically been removed. So that's why these two lenses are highlighted on here. The 20 is my real favorite for practical photography. It's light and small. It's fast, it's really sharp, and it's a little bit wider angle than our other zooms typically end up being. But the 24, if you're looking for a really good specialized lens, or in my personal favorite, the 19 f4, tilt shift lenses can really bring some interesting uh, options to your photography. So when it comes to DX, if you recall early on in digital, there was a criticism that smaller format that many digital cameras had, that you didn't have wide angle options. If you put a 28 millimeter full frame lens on one of these, it's not, it doesn't look like the same as a 28 did on film. It's now looking cropped in. So it looks like a longer focal length lens in a way. I know the internet can blow up about this, which way that goes, but here's what's happening is that it's cropping. So for that, we make a whole series of DX lenses that only project that sensor size and that allow you to get even wider angle than their full frame counterparts could in the sense that we don't make a 10 millimeter full frame lens, but we do make a 10 millimeter DX lens. On any DX camera, you multiply that focal length by 1.5. That gives you basically the equivalent focal length angle of view for a 35 millimeter film camera or full frame digital. So basically your 10 millimeter lenses on these become 15s. But that's the thing is we have a lot of good options for these. Everything from true just pure wide angles to some kind of an interesting intermediate ones. One of those is the 16 to 80. 16 to 80 is probably the best DX zoom lens I've ever shot. It is one of the only ones with nano crystal coating, electronic capture, VR, and a whole bunch of other awesome features. What I like about it is that it's really good wide range of, of uh, shooting. So the 16 to 80, if you do the math, actually works out to basically being equivalent to a 24 to 120 would be on full frame. But the fun part is that at 16, the 24 equivalent, you're at 2.8 instead of f4. But that means you truly have an extra stop of light gathering ability on that sensor. So if you have a DX body shooting this lens compared to a full frame body in a 24 to 120, when you're at wide angle, that DX body is getting one stop more light than the full framer would. But at the same time, that full frame sensor may just be one stop or more sensitive anyway, so it may well even out. But that means that the DX system, getting that advantage in this case, is still lighter, smaller, and less expensive. For hiking and a lot of travel, that can really be helpful. So if you're going wide angle, 16, get a Milky Way shot like this. But even if you zoom into 80 at F4, you can still blur a background out pretty well to do portraiture and general photography like that. By the way, the interesting thing is that that lighting you're seeing on the model on the left there is not natural light. It's actually a flash. Um, you may not notice until you start to really look around now that you know that. But here's what's going on. is It's a flash with a tungsten correction balance filter on it, a little orange gel filter that you can put on your flashes. Now, that's designed to, to be equivalent to a regular standard incandescent light bulb in terms of color temperature. That way, if you're using a flash inside, you can match the other warm lights inside if that's what they are. But if you're using a flash outside, it has a daylight balance naturally. If you add one of those orange filters, now it really does a good job mimicking the sunrise. If you add two of those orange filters, it does a very good job mimicking the sunset. So what I like about that 1680 is partially that you can shoot just about into your light source without getting flare. And part of that's the nano crystal coating. It really is good at suppressing flare. Then the other lenses, though, that I had on that list, the 10 to 24 and 10 to 20, the 10 to 24 is an older wide angle of ours. Still a very good lens and faster than the other one in terms of light gathering ability. But its um, main advantage, I'd say, is if you're still shooting an older DX body. If you have any camera older than a, than a D300, the 10 to 20 will not work on it. It won't auto or manually focus on it because of the new focus motor in that. But this one is equivalent with every digital body we have. So absolutely, even all the way back to D70s and things like that, you'd have no problem using a 1024. What I like about it is what I like about wide angles in general. Great opportunity for perspective distortion and making those nearby rocks, in this case, look much bigger than the rocks in the background. Um, but also just the ability to get it all in and to do it on a relatively small and light lens. But compared to the 10 to 20, 
10 to 20 is a really compelling choice these days because the 10 to 20 is lighter, cheaper, and stabilized compared to the 10 to 24. But it's not compatible with everything. So make sure that your camera is one of the ones on this list. Otherwise, this camera will not auto, or sorry, this lens will not auto focus or manual focus on the camera. Really won't be usable. So as long as it's equivalent, that would be my recommendation. But double check and make sure that it is. I don't want anybody getting a lens they can't use. Um, everything, by the way, for F mount still fits on everything. It's just a matter of what features will work, basically. So we've talked a bit about cameras, lenses. Next up is filters. Once you've got a good camera and lens, you like, you know, go out and shoot, get everything you can. The filters are another way to kind of expand what you can shoot and how you can shoot it. And I'd say by miles, the most popular filter out there is a polarizer. A UV filter is one you may have heard of as well. That's just a filter that basically protects your lens, kind of like a clear lens cap does, if such a thing existed. Um, and back in film, UV filters can improve your contrast. So if you're still shooting film, especially air to air at very high altitudes, then a UV filter really will help your black and white film contrast. So I assume most of you don't run in those sort of situations much. Um, polarizers are much more useful though. They're very, very relevant, useful filters for this sort of work and for many other things. But let's talk a brief thought about the drawbacks here too. What a polarizer is doing is it's removing glare. It's also costing you between one and three stops of light, depending on that polarizer, you know, what level of polarizer it is in a sense, how well it's made, how dark it is, things like that. But the basic point is that just like polarizing sunglasses can pull glare off the water so you can see fish better, or off windows so you can see through them, polarizing filters can do that same trick but in the same way that it'd be very difficult to read inside in low light with those sunglasses on, your camera's gonna have trouble focusing inside or in low light with a polarizer on it, because it's costing it some light it would need to focus as well. But the other thing that a polarizer is really good for is that it does remove um, reflections from water droplets too, including those in the atmosphere. Meaning that when you basically, when you look through the filter and you turn it, so you can see its effect, when you hold it up and you look at the sky, you'll see that typically there's an area of the sky that can go much darker than it already is. And so a polarizer can give you much higher contrast to the clouds in the sky, or it can balance the exposure difference between the land and the sky overall. The polarizer is most effective at 90 degrees to its light source, so 90 degrees to the sun, generally speaking, outside. Uh, meaning that if the sun's straight up, the polarizer will be the most effective at the horizon. If the sun's near the horizon, the polarizer will be most effective straight up. And of course, if it's in between, it'll be most effective in between. Um, I used to use this a lot with wide angle lenses and weddings, specifically so that I could put the bride's head in a small, darker area of the sky. But that was making use of a disadvantage of a polarizer, which is that because they're angle dependent, they don't polarize the entire sky evenly. So basically what ends up happening is, if you have a lens like a 28 or so, you're fine. The whole sky looks like it's been pretty evenly manipulated. But if you shoot a 10 millimeter lens with a polarizer on it, you're gonna see that one part of the sky gets darker and other parts of the sky are much less effective. You can use that deliberately in your composition to put a flower right in the middle of a dark spot or something like that. But just be aware that if you expect evenness across your sky, you might need to filter like a graduated neutral density. That might be the way to do that. But the other thing that a polarizer is well known for and absolutely useful for is stuff like this. When you're photographing water, especially in waterfalls, polarizers really, really come into their own. So as you can see, a lot of the rocks that are wet here obviously are very high contrast. They're reflecting a lot of light there. And because of that, you can't see most of this stuff, which is the leaves, the color, things like that underneath that glare. So when you turn, again, you bring a polarizer up to a lens and you turn it once it's on the, on the lens. But you can preview this effect by holding it up to your eye and just turning it. See if it does anything you want it to do. If it doesn't, put it back in the bag. But if it does, put it on your camera and turn it until it looks that way again. And what you can see here is by removing that bright white glare off the rocks and leaves and everything in the scene, a lot of the color is free to come out of it. Um, so now you can suddenly see the leaves on the rocks. You can see the green and the moss and the ferns better. Now, if you ever find that you're shooting a fall scene like this, even without watering it, using a polarizer can take the sheen off the waxy coatings that many leaves have, meaning that they'll get much deeper color and suddenly much look much better. That, in addition to a darker sky, and possibly the ability to look through the water and see some fish in there, it, it, the polarizer is a filter that can really dramatically improve your landscape shot. Also, random other thing, but if you're an automotive photographer, polarizer is exactly how you're gonna cut through glare on a windshield or on a car's wax uh, coating, on a clear coat, um, to get to the true deep paint color underneath. So polarizer is 
It's basically a filter that I don't think I know a single photographer that's really been been shooting for more than a couple of years that doesn't have at least one polarizer in their bag with them pretty much all the time. Um, people sometimes get multiple ones of different sizes. I generally try to get the biggest one that will fit the largest lens I have, and then I'll scale it down on, with separates for the other lenses. Now there's also an ND filter standing for neutral density. Neutral density is a reference to the fact that when you put them on your, uh, on your uh, lens, their density in that they block light, so they, they block a lot of light getting through your lens, but they're neutral in that they don't add a color cast, they don't add any other special effect. All this type of filter does is make things darker, simply put. Um, now the thing is that ND filters come in a wide variety of darknesses, so a variety of different uh, strengths, and what I tend to prefer are the more extreme ones, the 10 or 11 stop uh, neutral density filters that are out there. The reason is that to get a shot like this here, I need to do a very long shutter speed in the middle of the day. Um, I could do that by coming back here at night and shooting under a partially moonlit uh, kind of condition to get basically the same shot. But if you're doing that, then you have to deal with the reality of doing that, which is that now you're sitting in a random spot at night, truly quiet, with a camera and tripod there, dealing with a half hour exposure or something like that. And that's if it all goes well, that you get a photo at the end of that that you're happy with. You're more likely to trip over stuff, more likely to lose something if you drop it. You know, shooting at night is rewarding, but also more challenging. An ND filter can give you the same kind of shutter speed flexibility that waiting until nighttime can give you, but without any of those drawbacks. So again, ND filter just is very, very, very dark. Terrible filter to shoot inside uh, or for anything high speed and action, but that's never what they're really for. They're really more for slowing down your shutter speed so you can show water flowing, or in a case like this where it was a really windy day, I know this wasn't going to be a terribly interesting shot, but I just want to see what it would look like on a 30 second long exposure. And sure enough, with the trees whipping around, I thought it got a lot more interesting. So the most important thing though, accessory wise that you can possibly own, the best three secrets to color landscape photos would be tripod, tripod, and tripod. There's a lot of different things to think about when you choose a tripod, but I'm going to break it down into the three basic categories that we find tripods are broken down into. Stability, lightweight, inexpensive, those three features, it'd be nice if you can get them all, but you can't. You can only ever pick two of those. Now, in thinking about what that practically means, you can have a stable, lightweight tripod. That's the best case scenario. That might be made of something like carbon fiber, so a little bit more exotic, but something like that is inevitably going to be more expensive because it's made of more exotic materials that are still very strong and lightweight. Of course, there are also still extremely good options that are made out of aluminum and things like that that are much less expensive and still very stable, but they're going to be heavier than the carbon fiber options typically are. So that's kind of the balance between those two. You also, though, if you are following the list, have an option for lightweight and inexpensive. If you do that, you're probably going to have a pretty bad time because that means it's not going to be terribly stable. And an unstable tripod is pretty useless, in my opinion. I've taken some of the old broken tripods that I've destroyed and turned them into light stands and things like that once I've worn them out and they were no longer stable. But realistically, a good tripod is not going to wear out on you like that. Um, I've killed about $10, $30, or $40 clearance tripods over my life until I got one good $300 tripod. And the reason was I kept trying to make the other ones do stuff they weren't designed to do. Anything from like trying to get to a lower angle to all kinds of stuff. But gradually, they would wear out. I beat them up too much, and they really would fail over time. Um, some of the things that those didn't have that my current one does are things like a metal collar. You want to look for parts on a tripod that can be replaced if they break, um, if this is something you truly intend to own for a few decades. You never know what's going to happen to it, and this is something that goes out in the field. So if it gets full of sand, if it gets really hit by something, you want to have stuff you can replace if you need to instead of buying a whole new one, especially if you've already put a lot of money into the tripod. So finding modular parts like this or a good metal collar instead of one made of plastic means it won't wear out as often, it'll be more durable, and you can generally replace stuff if it does break. But the other thing, in the practical way, is make sure it's as tall as you are. Make sure that when it's fully extended without the center column raised, that it's at eye level, at least. If it isn't, you're going to spend a lot of your day, instead of being this person, being this person. And I've been that person way too often. Being the person where you're hunched over looking through your viewfinder means you're going to have neck and back things way earlier than you think you are. Um, it's one of those situations that I find will make you less comfortable while you're shooting. And if you're less comfortable, you're less creative. My goal when I get out doing good landscapes isn't just to get out and endure whatever I'm out in. Even if it's like minus 20, blowing you know, snow and stuff like that, my goal isn't to endure it. It's to be outside and be comfortable. I want to be comfortable at minus 20 in terrible conditions. I want to be comfortable at 100-something degrees. 
And the reason I want to be comfortable beyond wanting to be comfortable in general is because I want to be able to think. I want to be able to think without distractions. And having a tripod that distracts you by making you bend your body over to do this stuff after you've just carried a bag of beer two miles in the woods is just not worth it anymore to me. Um, and honestly, it's one of those things that if I changed around early on, I think I would have appreciated even more. Also, a quick release system it means that you can have multiple plates on if you own multiple cameras, put it on those. If you own lenses that have a tripod uh, collar on them, you can put a plate on that. The basic thing is you can take things on or off your tripod much faster using a quick release system. And that means you're going to use it more. At least that's what it means for me. By using it more, you're going to get better shots. By making them more stable, more deliberately composed, with a wider range of shutter speeds, and with lower ISOs. But this is my absolute favorite thing. Um, this is the feature that, to me, makes Embrace a tripod, and that is that the, the legs can move independently and the center column can come out and be reinserted at 90 degrees. The reason this is so important to me is that you never know when you're going to have to put one leg up on a staircase or something like that. You also never know, though, when your best composition is going to be at half an inch from the ground and when you might need to be there for two or three hours to do an amazing time lapse or great macro shot or any number of other things. The basic point here is that you... If you were used to thinking of shots your tripod can get, and then a whole other category of more interesting shots that you can get but your tripod can't, get a tripod that can go where you go. Get a tripod that can do what you do, and it will do it better for you, basically speaking, than, than ever doing it by hand. So we've covered a few things so far. Let's go the other ones to keep in mind, because these are those little things that <laughs> you, know, you might not think of. You might not be a memory card expert. That's fine. Here's what I'm trying to get to is, Make sure your memory card's at least twice as big as what you think you need, um, especially if you ever intend to consider shooting macro uh, focus shift or landscape focus shift or things like time-lapse video. Here's the thing is I'm not a video shooter. I'm much more still photo uh, experience. I don't have any professional experience in video, but I've been shooting a lot more time-lapse and a lot more high-speed stuff lately since our cameras finally offer that. And time-lapse, I've been told, is I think accurately the gateway drug to video. If you don't shoot video, try time-lapse. Everything you like about still photography and the setup, but then, you know, progress. Basically speaking, time-lapse clips, 4K clips, things like that, they take a ton more memory than those photos do. And then if you're shooting a composite, like an HDR or bracketed shot of bras, or if you're doing a focus shift shot, you might have a few hundred extra shots on your card that you didn't bank for. That suddenly means that when something else nice happens, you can't get it. So I'd always carry at least two memory cards just on the extremely rare chance that you either lose one or break one. Um, I'm more worried about a card physically being lost or broken than I am about it being erased or that or corrupting on it. They're, they're pretty stable these days, especially XPD and C FX Crest cards. Um, but also just make sure that they're big enough, both of them, and that they're fast enough to handle raw files on your camera. The other thing, batteries, always have at least two of those if you can. Um, I find our cameras do extremely well with battery life, but there are a few things you can do to make them even better. If your camera has any wireless system, turn it off. Go to airplane mode in the setup menu of your camera, and it will not drain the battery. Um, if you have a Z series, Z6 or 7, turn it to viewfinder priority mode. That means that the viewfinder is the only thing that will illuminate when you bring it up to your eye, but when it's away from you, neither screen turns on. So it saves a lot of battery life there, too. If you're shooting an SLR, use the optical viewfinder. That'll help quite a bit. Now, all of these are just recommendations to stretch your battery life. If you have enough batteries with you, Shooting live view might mean you suddenly have access to a virtual horizon you may or may not have had before. It means that if that uh, LCD comes out, now you can get to a low angle without laying on the ground and destroying your neck and back. Um, things like that. So make sure you have battery powers that are going to handle what you think you need, and then a little bit extra. Um, and remote releases are a really good idea. You, you can use your phone and many of our cameras to actually fire the camera. So if you forget a remote release, your phone using Snapbird can be that remote release in a pinch. But our dedicated one is going to be smaller and lighter. It's not going to require you to always have your phone and always be able to connect to your camera. It's going to use less battery power, and it's going to sometimes add extra options. Um, our WR10 system can, depending on camera, also fire a SP5000 wirelessly, and it can fire your camera from 164 feet away. Um, there are other things like that, but basically uh, remote releases can really help. And some of them can also help time the camera for interval and time lapse, going beyond what the camera can do internally. Um, I think one of our remotes, the 10-pin remote for SLRs, I think with two AA or AAA batteries in it, can do a, an exposure every five minutes for about three months. So some of those timers out there are remarkable. Basically, these are all the accessories that I, I know you probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about. 
but that are really worth remembering when it comes to just what you're going to put in your bag. Because when you're out in a place like this, I want you to be able to just look at and absorb a place like this. Just get a photo of it, get what you want out of it, enjoy it. And I don't want you to have anything in your way that you don't have enough space on your car, that your battery's dead, that your lens is the wrong lens, that you have the wrong filter. You know what I mean? I just want you to be as prepared as you possibly can be. So I hope that that's helped. Um, I'm absolutely happy to hang around and answer all the questions you have. So I'm going to stop my screen share and come back to you. There we go. Absolutely. Thank That was so much amazing information. So thank you so much for sharing. I want to go back through and look at some of these um, questions. Uh, and a lot of these were answered kind of as we were going, but I think it'll be good just to kind of share them again, just to make sure everybody saw them. Um, uh, the question came in, what advice would you give about anchoring and getting low and in depth of field? Do you prefer that the foreground be in focus? Hmm, that's a really good one. Um, so it's an interesting thing. I generally, when it comes to anchoring and getting low, I generally do like something in the foreground being in focus. It's almost one of those things of if I just have a whole landscape scene, I want to give my viewer a personal reason to be interested in it. And it's not just what the landscape background is. I want to have something really neat up here, over here. Just, just there's a reason to look at it so that you keep your eye moving around a lot. Um, generally, from what I've read, uh, I've read a few books on like the psychology of how people look at photos and things like that, just to, just out of interest, just to see if this has been studied and what they find. And in very general terms, what they find is that people look at the center of a photo first, and then they follow out areas of color, contrast, leading lines, things like that. And that when you think about the, well, here's, here's a fun one. If you hold your hand out at arm's length and look at any one finger without moving your eyes, take a look at the other fingers. They won't be sharp. It's something that can start to drive you nuts, but you only have in focus something maybe, you know, silver dollar size at arm's length. Um, everything else in your field of vision is actually blurry all the time, except for that spot. Your brain is constantly telling you that everything you can see is in focus and it'll challenge it going, but that's in focus. So you look at it and then you're seeing it in that sharp spot. So the thing is that your eyes just about never stop moving, which is why they sedate people when they go under laser eye surgery and stuff like that. And so my goal is to generally make sure the viewer's eye continues to engage with the photo the way it engages with three reality, which is that it never stops moving. So the longer you can keep a person's eye moving around your photograph, the more they're looking at it, the more engaged they are, the more interesting it is. That's why I like having a foreground subject anchor, because everybody looks at the middle first, which is usually around where the background is. Be. Then I want to have a reason to pull forward and then kind of work their way into that scene. Um, that's usually, to me, the basic, you know, armchair psychology of almost why I think anchoring a foreground makes sense. But the other part of that, the focus part, is almost cultural. In Western cultures, generally speaking, absolutely foreground and focus pretty much every time. But other cultures actually vary quite a bit. Some Eastern cultures prefer the background and focus with a foreground out of focus. Um, a good example of this that's, that's absolutely made it to the wedding industry is where you have a bride holding up a bouquet of flowers and you have the eyes in focus, but the flowers are out and they provide a lovely bit of color in front. Um, so it really depends on kind of what you want. And I'm sorry, because I know it's kind of a non-answer. But what I find is that actually culturally, it shifts where where the preferences are. So if you're aiming to appeal to a certain market, you might do it one way or the other. Um, but basically speaking, I like the foregrounds in focus. If I want to have a background in focus and I have something in the foreground, I have to make sure that that thing doesn't look like it's accidental. I have to make sure it has a reason to be there and it doesn't look like I just forgot to move it out of the shot. Because um, all too often, that's what I wind up with. Um, but if you have a great bank of flowers you're shooting through or something like that to get a good background, then that could be awesome. I love it. Great, great, great. So another question that came in um, is PC series the same as tilt shift? It is. So here's uh, what's going on there. So the original lenses that we had that were PC series lenses didn't actually have the tilt shift capability. What the PC refers to, actually, let me see if I... Okay, I am sometimes lucky enough that I can just turn around and grab exactly the thing we're talking about. <laughs> um, I have some good stuff behind me, but I didn't, I'm honestly surprised I don't have a tilt shift behind me because I do shoot tilt shift lenses a lot. So PC lenses are lenses that can uh, correct for perspect their perspective control. They can correct for um, the keystoning that occurs when a sensor is non-level to its subject. So what those are for would be taking the buildings that are falling over and making it so instead of looking up at them, you can go level and then the buildings go straight again. Um, if you go down, by the way, the buildings look like they're falling outwards. So it's it, whether you go up or down, they'll do this or that, um, respectively. So that's what PC lenses were entirely designed for. Um, the other cool thing, by the way, you can do with a PC lens is freak people out when you're selling mirrors. 
I know it's kind of random, but if you're ever selling a mirror online and you need a photo of it, and you happen to be a photo nerd like me with a PC lens, you can make it look like you're standing right in front of the mirror because the mirror will look like it has no distortion at all and you won't be in the shot. What it is, you're actually standing very off to the side. You put, you do the orientation um, instead of up or down, do it left or right. And then you can actually remove that same keystoning distortion you get, but left and right to make the mirror look level again so that everything looks like you're right in front of it. Um, but that's what <laughs> fundamentally do. Besides messing with people in, in uh, mirror listings, it's it's for removing perspective distortion. Or I'm sorry, I keep doing that for, um, yes, perspective Yes. Um, either way, um, the tilt shift part, though, is a later addition. That's something that allows you to manipulate your focus without changing your aperture. Now, what's so cool about this is that let's say that you have, um, if you just have a flat wall in front of you, you can put that in focus just fine with any lens because it's flat. But now if that wall is at an angle to you, you can put the front part or the back part in focus, or you can go somewhere really a third of the way in is the most efficient and then expand your depth of field to try to get all of it in focus. A tilt shift lens means that instead of the focus, this is your sensor, this is your focus, instead of it staying parallel, you can actually bend it. You can make it so it's a, something of an angle to your, to your sensor. Now what's cool about that is that may line up more efficiently with your subject, meaning that you effectively get extended depth of field. So more stuff in focus without ever changing your aperture. And if you go anything really past F16, even though more stuff looks in focus, all of it's less sharp due to diffraction. So tilt shift lenses with that ability are wonderful for changing your depth of field without ever dealing with diffraction. But they also let you do the opposite trick, which is one of my favorite things um, when I did a wedding engagement shoot once with the 85 tilt shift handheld is I could put the bride's head and groom's head in focus. There were, one was sitting on a bridge, one was standing. Everything else in the shot was out of focus because I can do the opposite trick too. You can make it line up in the most inefficient way to shallow out your depth of field as if you're shooting like a an F1 lens or so. Um, so the perspective control lenses became perspective control and tilt shift lenses. So these days, if, you're, if we're referring to a lens as a tilt shift, it also does the perspective control aspect. Excellent. Uh, question, another question that came in, is a variable ND filter as good as a specific ND filter? So where do you fall in that camp? That's a tough one. If I was a videographer, I would say a variable ND filter is even more useful than a normal uh, hard ND in that here's what this is, is a variable ND filter, for those of you that don't know, is a neutral density filter, like we talked about earlier, that's only goal is to block light getting into the camera. And a variable one, as you may suspect, varies the amount by which that happens. So you turn, it's a two ring filter, and you turn one of the two rings and it gets lighter or darker. It's a pretty neat thing to see, honestly. And the thing is that, um, Variable NDs don't get as dark as the darkest of dark normal NDs. So for that reason, I generally go for the much more aggressive, crazy, like 10 or, or more stop neutral density filters. Although variables, I think, generally range between two and eight. So they, they're very useful. If you shoot video, you have a, you don't have the ability to change your shutter speed as freely, and you might still want to shoot wide open, and you might not have a low enough ISO. So a variable can really make up that difference as a fourth mode of controlling your exposure. The thing is, when you put a variable ND on a really wide angle lens, it doesn't necessarily affect it evenly, especially not when it's at its maximum darkness. Um, so because of that, because of the uneven effect of a very wide angle frame, for the most part I'm shooting with just solid, normal, um, very, very, very dark ND filters. But if I was doing video all the time, I would have a variable ND. And I, I think I do actually have a variable ND that I've used for a bit. So if I only need a mild effect, I'll use that too. But generally speaking, um, I'll use the, the standard ND. Um, and if I need an ND and a polarizer, and I don't need it to be super, super, super dark, variable NDs also double up pretty well as polarizers. I'm pretty sure it's basically cross-polarization happening. So if you turn the entire filter, you can also vary, I think, the polarization effect. Well, I'd want to double check that. It's been some years since I've been. Absolutely. Um, for, and this was a question, is glass better in a fast lens than a slower lens? Not so is it a better quality of glass? Okay, um, Nikon makes over 300 different optical uh, types of glass, and you can almost think of it like different flavors. You know what I mean? It's, it's still all glass, but it's all different chemistries of the glass. So it really what the glass does, what its refractive index, how stable it is in temperature, a whole bunch of things that I definitely don't even know about, those are all variables that they can control for in the engineering of making the glass itself. But what's neat about this is that that also means that because we're the ones making the glass, we can put amazing stuff in fairly low 
price lenses too. Um, in 1855, one of the, the first version of that that came out had an ED element in it, which is amazing to me because anything with an ED element, from what I've heard, takes about six months or more to manufacture just the, due to the, the nature of making those things. And so what's amazing to me is that even the least expensive kit lens we made had an awesome piece of glass in it. So generally speaking, I would say that the best lenses we have, the most expensive, biggest ones, are probably still, of course, the best glass we have. You know, the $10,000, uh, 120 to 300 to 8 is going to have every optical trick we can pull out of our head. Same with the 180 to 400, the big primes, even lenses like the 105, 14, all that stuff is going to be as good as we can make it. But I would also consider that, don't forget, the, the less expensive stuff is still going to be as good as we can make it, really, because you're going to have a lot more people buying kit lenses, buying 24 to 120s, buying stuff like that. And if you want your company's reputation to be anything but garbage, you need to make sure that those lenses are extremely good too, and they are. The major difference, I would say, between the best and the, the biggest and smallest, the most and least expensive, like that kind of thing, is really down to durability, weather sealing, the types of features the lens has, whether it has vibration and how many reduction or how many modes in that, um, things like that. It's a lot of features and durability. So like um, I was shooting a wedding with a 70 to 200 28 years ago, and a little kid came running around a pew, went right into my lens, dropped, and then took off. Now, I had a lens hood on, which meant that I didn't have to wipe any kid face off the lens. And the <laughs> kid never made a sound. I never heard about it afterwards. So I assumed the kid was fine, despite all the craziness that happened there. So the kid hits the lens. That, you know, of course, pushes the camera into my face. So the kid basically runs and hits me in the face with, with my own camera. If I didn't, if I had a lens on there like an eight, like a 55 to 200, a lens that costs less than a tenth of, or around a tenth of what the 70 to 200 costs, but gets just as zoomed in, that lens would have probably broken right off of its mount. It also would never have survived handling full rain conditions like shooting during Hurricane Sandy outside the way that 70 to 200 handled um, and things like that. So the durability physically, like of it being strong, able to handle a career's worth of abuse and the weather sealing and the coatings and the features, all that stuff is why the bigger, more expensive lenses cost what they do. But optically, I'd say sharpness wise, there, there's generally some gain there, but it's not night and day. Um, you'd be amazed at just how good a current 70 to 300 is um, compared to even a 70 to 200 f4 to 8. They're really quite good. So I go that came in. Before. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Another question that came in was um, about the PF lenses. What are the PF lenses? Like what's the technology behind that? That makes those that unique. Are really, really cool. And those are a lens that I really wish I had behind me, but I don't have either one of them. So PF lens would be either the 300 F4 PF or 500 5.6 PF. So if you notice, both telephotos, both primes. PF stands for phase Fresnel. Fresnel element is something like what you may have been familiar with, with the lensing in a lighthouse or a flat projector uh, that you might have used in school where you, know, you put a plastic sheet on a thing and it projects onto the board. Those use Fresnel lenses too sometimes. Fresnel lenses are lenses made of basically concentric rings on an otherwise relatively flat surface. Instead of having one curve, it's kind of like that same curve, just flattened down into a series of rings. So what's neat about this is that you're able to still take a, a, a so here Here's, here's where this is relevant to phase Fresnel lenses in reality in our in our line is that there's a thing called um, there's a thing called chromatic aberration that is basically that it's very difficult to get all of the color it, just like how a prism breaks apart white light into a full rainbow it's very tough to get lenses that do that and then break it all back down into that single beam of white light again and to do that perfectly at every focal length and at exactly where the sensor is at the same time there's a lot of crazy stuff happening in your lenses that you may not think about. And that's fine. That's what I'm here for. A phase for now lens has exactly the opposite color profile of any other, um, if, in terms of a chromatic aberration, versus the refractive color profiles of the normal lenses. So you've got refractive index, or refractive lenses, which are just normal curved lenses like you'd think of lenses. Those have a, let's say, blue on one side and red on the other. Then there are diffractive lenses, which is what the face Fresnel elements basically are, and those are reversed. So what's neat about this is that by using just one of those bonded to an spherical element in, in, in the lens, you can take out a whole bunch of little lenses in there that were correcting for that kind of color spread um, that would be manipulating the light to bend it back into lining up again. You can take all those out because you just 
took this one that reversed the profile against all the others. So now they're canceling each other out. So now you can build a lens that's just as sharp, but a lot smaller and lighter. And that's what's amazing about the face for now lenses that I think they pulled out almost a pound from the uh, the original 300 F4 that was autofocus right before this one um, and made it like 40% smaller, 60% smaller. Like they really dramatically changed the size and weight of a lens smaller. while not really, it, it, without an optical uh, disadvantage that I've seen. That's awesome. So we do have a couple more, or we do have a little bit of time um, to, you know, get some questions in there. And I do have uh, just a couple things that I need to go over. So guys, get your questions ready. Uh, we're going to hang out here for a couple more minutes. Um, but I did want to let you know about a couple things that we have going on. Number one is the Talking Pixels podcast. So we released an episode last, I believe, Friday, um, and it talked all about pricing. So again, if you're into the business of photography, you definitely want to take a look at the Talking Pixels podcast. Again, myself and Justin Gamble, we get on there, we talk about business, and we don't talk about gear we don't talk about you know what's for sale this week there's no ads no anything we just talk about business and what it takes to start a business in photography so if you're looking for that kind of startup that um kind of take it step by step that's what this podcast is dedicated to I also want to let you know about Pixel Photo Fest. So August 14th through 16th uh, here in Cleveland, Ohio. As of right now, everything is full steam ahead for Pixel Photo Fest. We have some of the top presenters in the industry that will be sharing their knowledge with you. And again, I love my Lunch and Learn crew. So what we've done is we've actually put a coupon code together where you can save $100 off of that at conference. So a three-day event in downtown Cleveland, nonstop shooting, hands-on, some of the best in the industry for only $99. I want to let you guys know about that. And that code will be available until we you know, aren't doing these live streams every single day. I also wanted to let you know that our weekly photo contest is up. And this week's con this week's uh, theme is summer. So it, take any of your summer photos that you have. You can you know, take that however you want it. It could be how your summer's going so far. It could be someone named Summer. It doesn't matter. We want to know from your perspective, your point of view, what does summer mean to you? So here, you know, I have a shot that was, you know, it kind of looks like summer, but it was actually taken a couple days before Christmas when I was down in Florida. So this is when I think of summer, I think of this, but again, this was something that was even shot in the winter. So again, you can just whatever summer, you know, you brings thoughts of summer to you. That's what we want to see. I also want to let you know that Tether Tools is doing 10% off until the end of May. So we did a great little presentation with them about two or three weeks ago. So if you have questions on that or you want to watch and you want to learn more about tethering, you can go back to that as well. So I wanted to let you know that we're also doing virtual one-on-one. -on -one. So if you have questions that you want answered, you want to sit down and say, hey, I just picked up the D850. I want to learn a little bit more about some of the advanced features. We will do that. We can set up a time where we have basically you create work with us to create that agenda and we go everything you know one by one i did one not too long ago about live streaming another one i did with podcasting someone wanted to learn a little bit more about how to podcast so again if you're looking for more of that one-on-one -on -one help just reach out to us and we will be able to get that set up for you so i'm going to jump back over if you guys do have questions you know you can always reach out to us at the store sales at the pixel connection find us on instagram or facebook or you can always give us a call we are more than happy to help you. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time and all the knowledge, all the knowledge bombs that you dropped in. I can't thank you enough for your time. And again, thank you to the folks at Nikon for getting this set up. And thank you all for joining us. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you very soon. See you guys.